A new poll of America's four largest cities underscores the disproportionate economic impact of the pandemic on black and Latino Americans. The poll of residents in New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, and Houston found at least half of all residents either lost a job or lost wages or hours. But the percentage of residents with financial problems soared above 70 percent for black and Latino residents in some cities. The poll was conducted by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, NPR, and the Harvard School of Public Health. The foundation is a funder of the NewsHour. Yamiche Alcindor has a report on the connections between the health crisis and the economic impact on black and Latino Americans. In April, after a trip to a crowded local supermarket in Northern Virginia, Maria Zelaya felt sick. The 45-year-old came down with symptoms that sounded a lot like the one she'd heard on TV. Dolor de cabeza. I got a headache, body aches, and the following day my throat hurt. It was hard to swallow and I lost my appetite. I just wanted to stay in bed. Her test came back positive for COVID-19 and she was told she needed to self-isolate. That was easier said than done for Zelaya, who immigrated from El Salvador in 2003 and works as a dishwasher. She shares a two-bedroom apartment with her three daughters, as well as a friend and her friend's daughters. I was afraid, afraid for myself, for my girls, for everyone who lives in the house. You live in an apartment that's very small, and there's seven of us. That's a lot. But this is the reality we Latinos and immigrants live with right now. Just across the river in southeast Washington, D.C., Cecil Brown and his fiancée, Shanrika, who didn't want to use her last name, are just now recovering from COVID-19. Both have lost family members and friends to the virus and say there were some dark moments along the way. I'm a diabetic. Um, I have hypertension. So it was just like I was seeing myself on ventilators. I was just, just thinking the worst. Shanrika works at the front desk of a mental health center in Washington, and she says there were not enough protections to keep her from catching the virus there in July. Soon after, Cecil began showing symptoms too. I, I just didn't feel that she was in a safe environment. Then she gets it, and then she brings it to me. So I was angry. I was really, really angry. Together, these two stories help explain what's driving a national trend. According to a recent New York Times analysis of federal data, African Americans and Latinos have been disproportionately hit by COVID-19. They're three times as likely to contract coronavirus as whites and nearly twice as likely to die from it. You know, ultimately, economic issues are what's driving the impact of the virus in low-income and minority communities. Dr. Basim Khan is the executive director of Neighborhood Health, a chain of clinics in Northern Virginia serving 30,000 residents. Many of them are immigrants who lack health insurance. Since the outbreak, his clinics have ramped up free testing to try to identify and contain the spread. They have seen this startling pattern play out. While Hispanic residents make up 50% of their patient population, they account for 90% of the positive tests. They have higher risk because of the work that they're doing. Um, they have higher risk because they have to take public transport. They have higher risk because they're living in crowded conditions. And the reason they're living in crowded conditions is they can't afford enough to live in areas like Northern Virginia or the District of Columbia. In this area, the medium home price is about double the national average. So many low-wage earners in fields like construction, health care, grocery stores and restaurants also live in crowded homes where infections can spread easily. And ultimately that's what's really driven the epidemic in these communities. While Latino residents have been hit hard in Northern Virginia, in Washington, D.C., African Americans are getting slammed by the virus. The district has seen more than 14,000 positive cases of COVID-19. Half of those have been among African Americans, making them more than twice as likely as white residents to catch it. And despite making up less than half of the city's population, they've accounted for three quarters of the city's deaths. If the pandemic was looking for the perfect place to strike, to ravage through like a wildfire, it found us. Troy Prestwood is a neighborhood commissioner for yeah. Ward 8 in southeast Washington, D.C., where a third of families live below the poverty line. The ward leads the city in rates of cancer, heart disease, diabetes, and other conditions. And now it has the highest number of deaths from COVID-19, too. 
One of them was Curtis Orr, a 55-year-old immigrant from Trinidad who started his own dental business. He was Troy Presswood's cousin. He simply was a working man. He had a staff that was also working. And he was doing the right thing, living the American dream. And he got sick, like so many other people. Why do you think more black people are dying of the coronavirus, especially here in Southeast D.C.? It's because Southeast D.C. has often been left behind. He says that like Latinos in Northern Virginia, many African Americans here work in jobs they just can't do from home, depend on public transportation to get around, and live in multi-generational homes. And he said some in the community have become complacent about wearing face masks and social distancing. With only one grocery store in the entire ward, many depend on corner stores and fast food, high in salt, sugar, and fat. That combination of higher infection rates and higher rates of underlying health conditions has been deadly. In addition to all the other challenges I mentioned, we also lead the city in violence and homicides. Right now, homicides are up in our neighborhood and in our communities. So if that is an example of how we're coping, we're not coping well. Back at her home in Northern Virginia, Maria Zelaya managed to keep everyone else from getting sick by pushing all six of them into the other bedroom. Her main concerns now are economic. She hasn't been working since the restaurant cut back on its hours. She can't pay the rent and worries about getting evicted. While her children are U.S. citizens, she doesn't have legal status. As a result, she isn't eligible for unemployment benefits or federal stimulus checks. It's sad when you go to apply and they tell you you don't have a social security card. I'm sorry, I can't do anything for you. It's like they're shutting the door in your face. It's sad. But that's the reality we Latinos are living with. Can you afford to not work? No, <laughs> I can't afford not to work. Cecil Brown and Shenrika have been arguing about whether Shenrika will go back to work. The mother of three says she needs the money and has heard there are more protections in place now. But they don't want to go through this again. We're not sure that you get it one time and, and that's it. So our mindset have to be now never to get it again. That's, that's, that's number one. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Yamiche Alcindor in Washington.